today. Um, I usually send out via email the lesson I usually present just to the members of the church. So it's a little bit easier to follow along as well as you get to go back and kind of build your own convictions on the Word of God. So if you're visiting with us today and have not yet received that email, you kind of just nudge the person to your left or to your right. They can forward that to you. So it's just a little bit easier to follow along. If not, and you want to open up your Bibles, you can turn to Acts chapter 4. We'll be jumping around a little bit. Y'all, I was thinking earlier this week, um, there are some things in life that are not the same when you do it by yourself. Mm. It, it just feels completely different when you're doing it with friends or you're doing it just by yourself. You know, you think about it, have you ever heard of those people who like going to the movies by themselves? Oh. That just, that just is not right to me. That just sounds weird. Who do you turn to after the trailers and say, I didn't like that movie? You know, who do you turn to and say, oh, I would watch that, right? You can't even do that. Have you ever heard of the people that like going miniature golfing by themselves? Wow, that, that, that's a little bit more rare, but a little bit more depressing as well. Um, you know, I, I think about it, of why people get to this point in their life where I'm just going to do it lone wolf. I think people get accustomed to being by themselves. Yeah. Even more common within large cities. Why? Because people are surrounded by others, but yet still feel alone. Mm. So it's hard for their mind to equate people equal company. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not the solution anymore. People is not the solution to your loneliness. Why? Because we're around people all the time, and yet we still feel lonely. So why have them join you? They're probably going to be on their phone anyways. You know, I, 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 uh, if you guys have ever heard this guy, he's kind of like, my, I love him, I love his new songs. Uh, this guy named Alejandro Aurora. Uh, but there's a part of his song that says, you would rather scroll through my life than be with me. Wow. It's like, you you rather pick up my, my Facebook profile, look through that, than actually spend time with me. Wow. It's like, dang, that's pretty big. You know, I think sometimes life also makes you think that you have to do it by yourself. In the West, I think we start to admire the lone wolf, the one-man army, the self-made millionaire. We love those stories. There are more movies out today about the great hero than the great team. Mm. Everyone wants to be the Rambo, the Rocky, the Born Identity, the John Wick. Everyone wants to be that one person rather than the team. You know, how many boy bands are there out there now? Not that I ever liked any boy bands, but I'm just saying, okay. they, they quite dwindled throughout our time. See, this trend of just wanting to do it by yourself, I know Ian talked about it a little bit in his contribution, but I think this trend of misguided expectations, we have to do it on our, ourselves, can actually reach into different areas of our lives. Have you ever seen a child try and do something that's physically impossible for them, but all they say is, no, I want to do it by myself, yeah. right? And you're watching this little kid trying to stack chairs, and you're like, what is he doing? That's childish. Mm -hmm. But yet, as adults, we do the same thing. We hit a wall in our life and we go, people are trying to help us and assist us. And we say, no, I want to do it by ourselves. Mm. And we look at, well, we look at the child, we look at the adult. And you, you have to actually come to a realization, man, how childish mm. to actually think that way. I think this is also found in religion as well. People start talking about themselves and say, hey, I want to do it myself. I just want that personal relationship with God. Nobody else helped me. I'm just going to go and do it myself. It's kind of funny to say and actually uh, kind of stamp it on approval is if you want to do it by yourself, it will mean that you are alone. Yeah. I know it's kind of counterintuitive. You think, oh, of course. But even think about it. If you want to find God by yourself and understand his will by yourself, sometimes not even God will be with you in your adventure. Come on, Sean. In 1 Corinthians 12, 12, it reads, it says, just as a body, though one has many parts, all of its parts form one body. So it is with Christ. Meaning you can't choose to be separate from Christ's body and think you're going to get to his heart. Come on, Sean. That it, it's all connected right there. Yeah. That Christ's body, it goes on to talking about in this, in this chapter here, that Christ's body is a fellowship. It's his family. Yeah. That to get to God, you've got to get through his family as well. See, Christianity is one of those things. It's not the same when you try to do it by yourself. It's just one of those, it's like going to the movies by yourself. It's like miniature golf by yourself. It's just not the same. It's not how it, it was intended to be created. Right. See, the Bible even says in one of the greatest commandments is go make disciples of all nations. Yeah. 
Yeah. You want to try and do that by yourself? Right. Come on, Sean. You ain't getting anywhere. You ain't even going to get your neighborhood if you're going to try and do that by yourself. Yeah. See, as a church, if you guys are visiting with us, we've adopted a theme for 2020, which is radically inspired. Woo! But the first thing we must learn when we're talking about being inspired is we must be inspired together. Yeah. So my simple lesson of my, my title this morning is Inspired Together. Point number one, I wouldn't if I could. Point number one, I wouldn't if I could. Going through the Bible, there's actually many scriptures throughout the biblical text that highlights how essential it is to be part of a team. Sometimes it's within a story of a hero who's actually surrounded by a great team. Kind of look at Moses, right? Moses, okay, yeah, he part of the sea, he did all those things. But he also had Aaron, uh, Aaron and Miriam, his brother and his sister. Yeah. You had David, the great king. Okay, but you also had Jonathan and Nathan that was right there. You had Jesus. Okay, yeah, it's awesome. He did all the miracles. But he also had what? His 12 disciples. Yeah. Even when he went to the Garden of Gethsemane praying before the cross, he didn't do that alone. And then you have Sean, who has Teague and Joe and Chris. Woo! You know, it's actually quite challenging. I challenge you, go find a hero in the Bible who's independent. Right. You won't find one. It, it's impossible. I tried looking. You think King Saul, he was a hero in the beginning when he had Samuel. But when his relationship with Samuel started to get injured, it, his, his kingship got taken away from him. You think about Samson, the guy with the long hair, who had that great strength. Well, throughout his life, he never had a team. And at the end of his life, he dies alone. Judas, he betrays Jesus when? When he leaves the 12. Wow. That, that, that was the first thing that led him to betraying Jesus. Betraying Jesus. Sometimes it's more noticeable in the themes of the scriptures, not just a story, but actually what the scriptures are saying. Have you guys ever heard of the one another scriptures? Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's scriptures throughout, the, especially in the New Testament, that talk about one another. Uh, one another in English is two words, right? One another, obviously. But in Greek, it's actually one word. If I can say this right, a libel. And throughout the New Testament, a hundred times in 94 verses does it use this word. 47 of these verses are given to um, Jesus' followers. And Paul actually wrote 60% of these commandments. Wow. And you think about, okay, when Paul first got converted, uh, that says that, hey, how much you're going to suffer for my name? Right. It's kind of like Paul re re uh, responded to that, like, yeah, I'm going to suffer, but I ain't doing it alone. You're coming and suffering with me. You're going to suffer with me. We understand, actually, how he was able to make it through this. But it goes on, and one-third of these commands that is talked about in the New Testament is telling the church to get along. Same in Mark 9, verse 50. It says, have salt among yourselves and be at peace, peace with each other. One-third instruct Christians to love one another, Ephesians 4, 2. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. About another 15% of these scriptures talk about the attitude of humility and defensiveness against believers. And yes, four of them talk about kissing, but a holy kiss, all right? They're brothers and sisters. Um, but all these scriptures talk about and concern the church and how unity is a standard for the people. Come on. And one of my favorite scriptures that really depict this, of not just doing it by yourself, but together, is Acts chapter 4, verse 32. Come on, Sean. It reads here, all the believers, not just all the leaders or all the pastors or all the, you know, the youth group leaders. No, it says all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord, uh, Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there was no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph the Levite from Cyprus came to the apostle called Barnabas, which means the son of encouragement. Sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. And we'll just stop there. You know, going back to the beginning of that verse, verse 32. Have you ever read a scripture where you're like five words in and you're like, okay, that's enough. <laughs> like, I don't need to read anymore. You can stop reading now. 
You know, it's kind of like throughout the Bible in Matthew 6, 24, it says, you cannot serve two masters. Okay, that's enough. You don't need to, you don't need to preach anymore, Jesus. In James 1, 2, it says, consider it pure joy. Okay, 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 you can calm down now. Pure joy, that's all I need to hear. You know, do everything without grumbling or arguing. You don't even need to know the rest of that text. You're already challenged. In the beginning of the scripture, all the believers were one in heart and mind. Come on. That's enough. We're already here. Oh, man, my, my, my heart and my mind is not with my brothers and sisters. Okay, I'm done. You read this and be like, not even two heart and mind? It's not even the, the women of the church can be unified and the men can be unified and that's good enough? Right. No. All were in one in heart and mind. Not even the, the young people can be zealous and the old people can be have wisdom. No, no, no. We're, we're, we're all together. It talks about there's complete unity. I think about it. What's, what does it mean to have the same heart? Well, having the same passion. Having the same love. The same humility. And at times the same pain. We're going to suffer together for this. The same mind. What does that mean? I think if it's at least in a church setting, okay, we have the same goals. We have the same plan. We have the same execution for these things. We're, we're all right there. There's no somebody uh, behind a little bit there. And it talks about all the things throughout these next couple of scriptures, I believe, were only accomplished because those first five words were proven true. One in heart and mind. See, throughout the Bible, actually, it does teach you that you can accomplish and do great things without God. It actually proves that. If you want to do great things and want to do it without God, you actually could. Saul was able to, the King Saul, the first king, was able to conquer and kill thousands without a heart of God. The disciples were able to rebuke demons and heal many without prayer. Throughout the text, it actually says you can accomplish some things. You just won't ever really accomplish God's will for you. There's some atheists or people who don't believe in God that actually have prosperous life, successful lives, and maybe even good and happy marriages. But they're not actually going to ever do God's will. Mm -hmm. See, you'll be a Saul, you'll never be a King David. Well, right. You'll reach some, but you'll never reach those who are actually in desperate need. Mm -hmm. We all need to get to this point where we can realize this, I can do great things without God, and we kind of continue our lives. But you need to get to this point where even if you could, you wouldn't. Wow. Even if you could do it alone, you wouldn't want to. Technically, I could go to the movies alone. I just don't want to be depressed. <laughs> Technically, I could sign up for miniature golf alone. It just ain't going to be that much fun. I don't even want to if I could. Why? Because I think in different areas of our lives, we've tried and it just wasn't the same. Yeah. Yes. You feel free and independent, but you also felt alone. Yeah. Yes, you may have done it faster, but you also lost time that you could have spent with others. You think, you think you're actually being productive, but you're not. You're wasting your life. It talks about here in 1 Peter 1.18. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. It talks about here that our ancestors have handed us down this empty way of life. Wow. And, and we're redeemed from that. We don't need that anymore. We don't need to choose it anymore. See, it's a life where you're filled with things, but empty of meaning and love. And that's the type of life where you've decided that you're going to do it alone when you don't really need to. See, for those that are part of the church, we actually had a decision in our lives at one point. Where we had to make a choice where we can face this world by our, uh, alone, by ourselves, or we can face it with God. Come on, Sean. There's a lot of people who continue to choose to face this world without God, and they can. But we just came to a point where we're like, I could, but I don't even want to. Yeah. It's, it's not even, it's, it, it has no benefit to my life. In the same way, people can come into church and say, yeah, and then you could read the Bible by yourself. You could pray by yourself. You could get on Google and YouTube and understand a little bit more. You could. But why do you even want to do it by yourself? Yeah. Come on. 
That's, that's a lonely life right there. Yeah. It, Christianity was not built for YouTube. Right. It, was, it, it did not have Google in mind. It had another human being sitting across from you and teaching you and you're getting to your heart. Come on, John. That's what Christianity was. Jesus didn't build the Bible and say, okay, one day they can just listen to themselves on an app. Yeah. That, that was not his, his, his mind when it came to this religion, when it came to this truth. It was getting people to sit across from each other and give each other their hearts. Yeah. See, for people that are visiting the church today, you still may respond to this message and say, well, I hear what you're saying, but... I feel like I just need to do it on my own time. I want to do it on my own and figure it out by myself. Then, if you're responding that in your heart, this church is not for you. We are not do-it-alone do it church. Yeah. To be honest, the Bible is not for you. Right. Come on, um, you can go pick up Buddhism or some other religion where it says just do it yourself, avoid pain. But Christianity is not for you because it's a, it's, a, it's a religion, it's a truth based off of community. Yeah. People might be say confusing things though when they get they hear this. They're like, well hey, I understand what you're saying, Sean, but I can't really give you my heart until I know you first. Mm. Well, to be honest, you won't ever really know me until you give me your heart. Yeah. Right? Because what most people try and hide is actually what exposes of what if people really love you or not. Yeah. You're trying to hard the scars in your life and the pain in your life. Well, if you show that to me or anybody else, you'll see if they really love you. Come on, Sean. You're trying to present your the best looking self, your model self. Well, everyone's gonna love you. Yeah. That's not a real love test right there. You gotta actually give us the the, the, the muck of your life, mm -hmm. the garbage, the trash, and see if we still respond with mercy and grace. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everyone loves the best version of another. If you want to actually test if someone loves you. Give them your heart, your true heart. Shine. Be fully present. Present your scars and see what happens. Then you'll be able to kind of filter out who's going to be there for you or not. If you are worried to give us your heart, well, think about it. We've already given you our hearts. Sometimes people think, well, hey, I have to wait. What do you mean? We're giving you our hearts. You don't think we're afraid? You don't think we're afraid that you're just going to take our heart, kick it around, and leave anyways? That happens a lot in Christianity. To many of us, and it doesn't really feel good. We pour our lives into somebody. We want to help them have a relationship with God, and they, they walk away. You don't think we're afraid? I remember one time where uh, I was back in Sydney. So I, I'm, I'm originally from America, as you most of you already probably deduced from my, my accent. But uh, I lived in Sydney for about five years. And in the first year when I was actually in Sydney, um, I was walking home from a friend's house. And it was about maybe 10 o'clock at night, maybe 9 o'clock at night. I don't exactly remember. But I was walking by, and out of the corner of my eye, I hear and I see this woman just crying. This young lady just crying on the side of the road. And so I was like, okay, I need to go do something. I need to talk to her. And so I started talking to her, and she starts kind of confessing, just getting open about her life. She's like, yeah, I just got kicked out of my boyfriend's house. He just abused me. He took all my stuff. Um, I'm dealing with drugs. And I just have all these different addictions. And it, it, it was just on my heart. And I was trying to always, I, I got her phone number. I got to reach out to other women in the church and trying to bring her around and really help her. And to be honest, it was probably for about two years that I tried to keep reaching out for this girl. Mm -hmm. And she still has not really reached out to me. Or she would kind of contact me back a couple of times, but never really done anything. And I've given my heart to this girl. Mm -hmm. I've, I've tried to help her, not just for my own benefit, but for her. And nothing against her or anything, because I know she's going through some difficult times in her life. But it's just to say is you'll never know the pain of really giving until you give everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've given this girl everything, and it, and it hurts every time. I, saw, I remember I saw her. I tried inviting her to church. I didn't know, but she came to church on drugs. And it, it, just, it just wasn't a good scene. And I was like, I, I love this girl, but it's, it's just hard. It's the same thing, guys. If you don't really give your full heart, you'll never understand what it really means. Right. See, the call is to give your whole heart to those that are around you, to choose to do it together. Not alone, uh, not 
not only will you see the difference in your own heart, but once you actually allow people to get into your life, you're going to impact those lives as well. Yeah. Looking throughout this text, you know, I think about it even in the church. When you start to ask people to pray for you and God answers those prayers, that increases your faith and their faith as well. Yeah. It's like, oh, you, you got to join with me in prayer right yeah. now. When you start to do things together, you build something together. Not only are you building memories, but you're building miracles in your life. It actually also says in the, in the Bible that God's presence is drawn to gatherings of his people. In Matthew 18, 20, it says, For where there are two, excuse me, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. There's something about when people gather to do something good for God that God's like, I'm gonna be there specifically. Come on, John. And one of my favorite things about doing things together is that you fail together. <laughs> you learn together. I love failing with others because it makes it a little bit more bearable, you know? Uh, as a kid, I got in trouble all the time. But the worst time is when you get sent to the principal's office by yourself. Yeah. You know, if you have your little confidant, your other guy coming up there with you, that's okay. You know, you kind of lie together. But, uh, but if you're just going there by yourself, I, I would always just cry right away. Um, there's an example, just even in life, of how this impacts and leads to success in so many different lives. Most of us know who Steve Jobs is. And we also know what Pixar is. Uh, since 1995, when Toy Story was one of the first movies out from Pixar, and they created 14 movies after that, uh, Pixar always had this focus and value on teamwork and collaboration. Originally, the company was built and planned to have like three separate buildings in Pixar. But when Steve Jobs saw the plan, he went in and scrapped it all and made it all into one building. So the, the programmers and the animators and the management were all going to be stuck into one building. Even more so, he actually took it a step further where, yes, it was all in one building, but he put all the mailboxes, all the meeting rooms, all the coffee bars, even the bathrooms, all in just one corner, one spot. And so what he was doing is he was making sure that people would run into each other. In the beginning, people were mad. Like you're saying, I have to go all the way to the end of the building just to go to the bathroom to get a cup of coffee? But what he wanted to do is make sure that everybody was running into each other. And he actually said, like, hey, when I see people not running into each other, I'm, I'm a little bit worried. Then. They actually started their motto in Pixar is alone no longer. And I believe that's where it led to their success. I believe the first church had the same motto, alone no longer. They found ways to give their hearts, and excuse me, to get their hearts and minds together. Oh, and we must do the same thing today or we are going to remain mediocre in our lives. Oh, oh, See, the Bible says actually the word encouragement in Greek means to come alongside and help. Mm, come on. See, to spur one another on in the text is not the same thing to cheer. Mm. It's not the same thing. You can... The, the, the words, you can do it, is not the same thing as let's do it together. Yeah, come on, There's a big difference. That when you're going to encourage, it's going alongside and actually helping. My first challenge, guys, is choose. Even if you could, choose to not do anything alone. For those that are in the church, I want to encourage you, no more Bible studies alone. Get people to invest in those that you are trying to love. Even in the personal things that you have in your life. The prayer. Your personal Bible studies with God. Get people in your life. For those that are visiting the church, I always encourage you guys, study the Bible with those who brought you, brought you along. We know you can go do it by yourself. You have Google. You can probably learn more than I can actually ever teach you. But choose to have somebody invest in your life. Yeah. Yeah. Choose God's will rather than your own. And when the Bible studies get hard and difficult and challenging, as they all do, right? The first five words, we already got challenged in our hearts. Don't respond with, I'm going to do it by myself now. I need time to go and pray by myself. It's challenging now, I'm going to go and uh, seclude myself. No. Get those other people that have been praying with you and get them into your life. Get people to pray in your life. Point number two, and coming up to a conclusion. Point number two is, I need the needy. Mm -hmm. See, when it comes to giving your heart and your mind, the topic of giving everything will always not be that far away. 
You know, we must share everything in common as this scripture has told us. You know, there's a story about a boy going up and sitting on Santa's lap. And he was telling Santa all the things that he wanted, but Santa started to notice that. He started to ask two for everything. Santa, can I have two bikes this Christmas? Santa, can I have two uh, uh, fire trucks this Christmas? Santa, can I have two race cars this Christmas? Santa gets a little confused, like, Wait, why do you keep asking for two? He said, well, I have a brother and I don't want to share mine. <laughs> See, I think sometimes we can get used to sharing the extras and not sharing the essentials. The first thing that they did before they saw the miracles in their life, they shared the materials and then they shared in the miracles. As we read the scripture again in Acts 4, 33 through 35, it says, With great power the apostles continued to testify the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in all of them, not just the apostles, that there was no needy, uh, needy persons among them. Well, how was God's grace being worked? It wasn't just God just throwing money out of the sky, right? It says, For time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. See, the church realized that, yes, God was going to know the need and fulfill the need, but God was also going to use that, them to fulfill that need. You know, as Tegan and myself are honored to lead the church here, Woo! it is my job to know the needs, but it is your job to fill them. It's not my job to fill every single need of the church. It's not, it, I'm not going to be the one-man army. I'm not going to be, oh, the preacher does it, or the youth group leader does it. No, it, it, it is our job to fill the needs. Yeah. It says here in 1 Corinthians 12, 26, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. I believe that there are some times that we are not rejoicing with each other, or not even mourning with each other, because we actually haven't let people into our lives. We're not telling people of the things that we're hurting about. But the thing is, is actually, yeah, you can be afraid to show your pain because you don't want other people to feel pain, but to be honest, that's exactly what the scripture is telling us to do. What you're afraid to get people, uh, afraid to push people out of your lives, you're pushing people out, and because they might feel pain, it, that's exactly what the scripture is telling us to do. You hiding your pain makes the body suffer more. If your arm didn't tell your body or your mind that it's in pain, it hurts the whole body. It leads to infections. I remember there was a time where uh, I grew up playing American football. And uh, it, in the middle of a game, I actually, I don't know if I fractured it or something, but I, a ball came and it like jammed my finger and it hurt a lot. Uh, but I didn't tell the coach. And so there's a couple, two more plays later and three, three more plays after that. Uh, they throw the ball to me, and I kept dropping them, and I could have got, and I could have scored. Um, I kept dropping because my finger hurt. And after about, after uh, we went into halftime, I told my coach, like, sorry, my my fingers hurt. He's like, what are you doing? Like, you're hurting the team. I don't care if your finger, you know, I, I I I don't feel bad for you that your finger is hurt or whatever. Like, amen, that's okay. But you're hurting the team by not telling us your injury. And I was just like, God, because I thought he was gonna be mad at me or anything. But he was like, why didn't you tell me sooner? See, you concealing your pain or hurts helps no one. You say to yourself, I don't want to be a bother, but now you have become a burden. Mm. An injury is not a burden, but an imposter is. Somebody who says, yeah, I'm okay, and I don't need any help, wow. that actually hurts the family more than you just saying, hey, I, I, I'm a little bit weak, I need help yeah. in my life. See, the church actually needs needy people to keep us loving and humble. I've been kind of jumping back and forth to this scripture, but in 1 Corinthians 12, 22 through 25, talking about the church and the body of Christ, it says, On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. The parts we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable, we treat, are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lack it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. Talking about coming together, guys, and being inspired together. As a church, 
we have this goal and are inspired to go from, we've only been a church for about a year, but we have our, our goal this year is climb to 50. And that is just pretty much the goal of getting to where we are now to a membership of 50. Yeah. And the thing is, is what we're not looking to do is we're not looking to have a few standout heroes this year. We're not looking to have, oh wow, Chris did an amazing job, or Millie did a great job bringing people into the church. If that's the end of the year and we still reach our goal, we failed in God's will. Yeah, yeah. come on, John. It, it, it's not about just hitting the number, it's that we do it together. Yeah. Yeah. See, for most of us guys, most of us want to be fruitful and come into the church, but you know, each and every single person when we're climbing to that 50, the person who joins the church should not just be based off one person. It should be a multiple people loving us. Absolutely. It should be multiple people coming in and getting into their lives. Yeah. That they should not be one person's answer to prayer, but be many people's answer to prayer. See, my encouragement today, guys, is to reform what you think Christianity is. Mm -hmm. It's not the same when you do it alone. It's not the same when you're just going to go and do it by yourself. For those that are in the church, I really want to encourage you. Get open about your life. Let people get into your life, and let's start doing it together. For those that are visiting the church, I want you to make that decision. We understand you can do it by yourself, but decide otherwise and say, I'm going to let God's people into my life and do it God, how God wants us to do it. Thank you very much, sister.